Okay, here we go. Good evening, everyone. My name is Roxanne Douglas, and I currently work for the English and Comparative Literary Studies Department at the University of Warwick. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, rox underscore Douglas underscore if you would like to. Uh, we can continue our conversations there. I'm so excited to be speaking to you today on this topic as it represents a part of my doctoral research. So I have a lot of affection for it and also please be kind. Um, but if you're interested in some of the folklore that we will be touching on in this session, uh, Rayam Ramani did a, a Romancing the Gothic session earlier in October called The Oriental Woman and the Romantic Gothic, which is now on the Romancing the Gothic YouTube channel that I would recommend. Uh, this session is also paired with the reading group on the fantastic Silences Ascents by the equally fabulous Leila Alamar uh, that we had last week. Uh, just as a quick content warning, we will be discussing rape, sexual assault, femicide and harm to children. So if any of that just isn't for you today, that's totally fine. You can always catch up on YouTube when you are in that space, won't be offended. Look after yourselves first and foremost. Okay. So in this session, we're going to be looking at how Gothic writing manifests, not just in Arabic speaking cultures, but more specifically around how contemporary feminist authors in some regions of the Arabic speaking world use what we might consider a localized Gothic in order to theorize their own feminism and feminist concerns. I'm interested in texts from around the 1980s onwards in particular. I'm going to discuss and um, suggest that the kind of Gothic that I'll sketch for you today speaks to Arab feminism's place in global traditions of feminism and literature. I'll be drawing on feminist writing from Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, and Palestine uh, that's been written since 1979 onward. Before we get started in earnest, I think it'd be worth having a brief geography explainer. So the area in yellow is what is typically considered to be the Arab world. What scholars generally mean by this term is that the area shares certain linguistic, cultural, and religious qualities. However, as you can see, this is a huge geographical area and therefore the term that suggests this is actually quite homogenizing. So instead I try where I can to be more specific by using terms that come from the Arabic speaking region itself to describe the areas within it. So my doctoral research was focused on parts of Al Mashrek. Mashrek basically me means a uh, place where the sun sets and Maghreb, uh, the other side, uh, means place where the sun rises. My research in today's, today's talk will mainly focus on parts of Al Mashrek, which is here, um, the countries which were at one time considered key parts of Greater, Greater Syria or Asham, or sometimes it's called the Levant, which is a colonial term broadly meaning the Eastern Mediterranean, the exact borders of which changed a lot due to a history of colonialism. The borders that we see and know today are established by France and Britain post-World War I. So as we can see, the uh, sometimes, it's, excuse me. <clears throat> so as we can see, sometimes due to colonialism, but in fact also due to commerce and world literary systems, the Arabic speaking world has not been hermetically sealed from the rest of the world and the West. Often the Western imagination places it, the, uh, imagines places in these areas as so distinctly other that it's hard to comprehend the pouring back and forth of cultural artifacts, including genres like the Gothic. Which brings me to the Gothic itself. You may be quite familiar with an image like this. Gothic abbeys, castles and stately homes in a state of decadent decay litter Gothic medias and some parts of Britain, which I hope you all have an opportunity to enjoy at some point. Gothic architecture is perhaps the backbone of the literary genre itself. After all, the genre takes its name, the Gothic, from the architectural style. Fred Botting, apologies Sam, uh, argues that medieval edifices, abbeys, churches and graveyards especially, but in their generally ruinous states, hark back to a feudal past associated with barbarity, superstition and fear. This is to say that Gothic architecture represents a specific European history and religious cultural landscape from which modern society has departed, but nevertheless fears a return to. Yet the architectural Gothic style itself may also be, according to Diana Dark's recent research, excuse me, recent research, stealing from the Saracens, this style may not be as quintessentially as European as we might have once imagined. According to Dark, the Gothic, a style so closely identified with our European Christian identity, 
owns its origins to Islamic architecture. Dark explains that when Christian crusaders mapped the Holy Land, they mislabeled the Dome of the Rock as King Solomon's biblical temple. As a result, uh, she says, well into the 18th century, when the error was finally realized, many European churches were modeled on a Muslim shrine. A profound Islamic influence can be seen in many of Europe's most iconic buildings, including St. Paul's Cathedral. The reason that I bring this up now is firstly to show how arts and cultures do cross cultural borders, but I also want to flag that Arab feminist gothics that I'll be describing to you today do not simply suggest that Arab feminists absorb or adopt certain tropes, and indeed that feminism and feminist artistic techniques are not somehow a gift from the West, but rather it's much a, there's been a much more complex intercultural exchange than we might first imagine. For instance, the English term ghoul uh, is actually derived from an Arabic term, al khul uh, which is a pre-Islamic uh, sort of supernatural being, which would hang around graveyards and feast upon human flesh. Does that sound familiar? For those of you who don't know, this is a still from George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, which, although not actually the first zombie film, uh, certainly captured the imagination of the Western movie going public. The zombie enthusiasts among you may remember that the term zombie is never actually used in the film, but instead they're referred to as ghouls. The Gothic, I think, is a really useful lens to think these exchanges through. It is a genre that is especially interested in slippages of borders and breakages of boundaries. So this leads me to Glenis Byron's concept of the global Gothic. Byron demonstrates how the Gothic genre facilitates and theorizes slippages between different national contexts hence the joining of global and Gothic, in one word, global Gothic. Byron does this to examine how the Gothic has a particularly intimate relationship with the process and effects of globalization. Byron uh, discusses about the number of different national Gothic traditions that began being noticed by academics in the 1990s and asks, what were the conditions that had produced such a proliferation of Gothics? And what were the general implications of this proliferation for what the West had understood as Gothic? There was also increasing evidence that the emergence of cross-cultural transnational Gothics that called out for attention and which suggested that, despite the emergence of so many national and regional forms, in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, Gothic was actually progressing far be beyond being fixed in terms of any one geographically circumscribed mode. Most importantly, perhaps it was clear that these developments in the increasingly diverse and problematic genre labeled Gothic were intrinsically connected to the historically specific conditions to the development of an increasingly integrated global economy. What this essentially means, according to Byron, is that literary or cultural objects wind up on the global marketplace due to economic globalization. It's worth noting that most of the novels discussed here are uh, translated texts, which some would argue also represents a slippage of meanings between a source culture and a language and a target culture and language. Therefore, I do approach Arab feminist texts with particular sensitivity since, as Michelle Hartman, a uh, scholar of uh, Arabic translation, she argues that Arab women writers are characterized by the academy as exceptional interlocutors who act as go-betweens telling us, the West, about them. My aim here is instead to use the Gothic as a frame to privilege and critically engage with the complex, artistic, allegorical work of these novels, especially given the lack of engagement with some of these in the Anglophone Academy. So bearing Glenis Byron's notion that the Gothic emerges in a specific market and historical conditions in different places, we can trace the genealogy of Arab feminist Gothic in the larger context of Arab women's literary history. Uh, Glenwa Hayek writes that Nada sensation story, uh, which is El Nada is a uh, term that describes the Arab awakening, uh, particularly around Egypt, Lebanon and Syria during the second half of the 19th century and early 20th century. She discusses how these sensation stories were published in journals and were typically written by women. And they made use of the relationship between anxious emotion, specifically fear and prose narrative. Given Byron's assertions that global Gothics emerge in a increasingly integrated global economy, it's pertinent to note the Hayek's assessment that the sensation story in the Arabic speaking world 
also emerges during a time in which the role of the woman within the home was being produced not only through a dynamic and active dialogue between male and female citizens, but also in order to meet the desires and demands of an increasingly globalized marketplace. It also just so happens that Hanan al-Sheikh, who we're gonna be discussing uh, in a little bit, in an interview with the New York Times, stated that her favorite heroine is Jane Eyre and her favorite anti-hero is what's his name it, from uh, Frankenstein in Baghdad by Ahmed Sadawi. This is to say that readers and writers in the Arabic speaking world are again, not hermetically sealed from the global literary market. And thus the Gothic and Gothic references are available to the Arab feminist consciousness, which we can tease out in our analysis and discussion today. The Gothic style, I would say, flexibly accommodates plural and sometimes contradictory realities, which includes a way of adopting a style that's perhaps not totally indigenous, but making it so. I have an etching here by R. Graves from around uh, 1874, which uh, depicts a young Victorian woman reading a ghost story. The etching itself is also called the ghost story. Uh, exciting the body and emotions in the same way that around the same time that Hayek describes nada sensation stories were in circulation. Hayek notes that the Victorian sensation story in her own paper was influential on these and notes how these stories were often symptomatic of the problems of modernity, particularly anxieties over the domestic sphere and over women's bodies. And again, these were in circulation in the Arabic literary scene alongside other English texts. The Argroves etching also speaks a little bit to concerns over women's Gothic readership, that it would have been an invitation to bodily sensations that were not becoming or too exciting for women's weaker constitutions. As we can see, Women's writing and readership at the turn of the century was grappling with fear as a feminist issue. So where was this fear drawn from? While we can acknowledge that these exciting stories are metaphors for questions about modernity and women's agency, what does an Arab feminist Gothic draw on for its own Gothic tropes? Botting points out that European Gothic is a ge general and derogatory term for the Middle Ages, uh, conj which conjured up ideas of barbarous customs and practices of superstition, ignorance, and extravagant fancies and natural wildness. There are analogous historical touchstones in the Arabic speaking world that serve the same purpose in the that the medieval period provides for the European and Anglophone Gothic writers. This is the pre-Islamic historical period of Jahiliya, uh, which has a similar cultural resonance as the pre-Enlightenment period. The term itself signifies the time of ignorance before Islam and thus shares with the European medieval period a sense of pre-enlightenment values. According to uh, Salma Khaldra Jayusi, uh, writings and stories from the Jahiya period contain many myths and fabulous tales in which the jinn and supernatural creatures, uncanny beings and events figure greatly. Even the way scholars write about this time contains some of those gothic keywords that we're really used to such as the uncanny and supernatural. So let's take a look at some of the creatures or figures of this kind of folklore. So we've already mentioned uh, the Hul, who feasts on graveside flesh. Uh, you might have also heard of Jinn, which is a general term uh, used to describe a magical sprite or demon, although demons are strictly called shaitans. Um, but Jinn is like an umbrella term for things like the Hul and the Ifrit. The Ifrit is a uh, spirit or jinn who hangs around graveyards and abandoned spaces. Of particular interest today though is the Karin or Karina in the feminine. The Karina is a ghostly double that everyone has shadowing them through their whole lives, including you. Yours is with you right now. Uh, so you have to try and please your Karina so that it does not become malevolent. So for instance, if you're offered a takeaway and you decide instead to have whatever's left over in the fridge, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, but your Karina really wanted that takeaway, then it will become malevolent and try and mess up your life by making kind of unlucky things happen to you. So the Karina double speaks to the Gothic frame where doppelgangers or mirror doubles reveal the worst parts of ourselves that we have to overcome or which haunt us throughout our days. Indeed, Botting argues that the double signals a psychological split, which I think transculturally speaks to many feminist concerns about women's psychology and divisions between one's sense of self and the world around you, or even divisions between mind and body. 
The Karina appears in contemporary texts such as Hanan al Sheikh's story of Zahara or Mansura Ezeldin's Maryam's Maze, which we'll be taking a little look at in a bit. So Jahiliya storytelling traditions and supernatural figures such as the Karina uh, provide Arab feminist writers with traditional folklore uh, upon which they can hang their Gothic examination of women's suppressed histories and the dark depths of the psyche. Excuse me. The Thousand and One Nights famously emerges as an oral story from the Jahiliya period with quite a complex origin story uh, in as much as it may actually come from India and may not actually be as Arabian in the Arabian Nights context as we might think. Um, nevertheless, I wanted to just touch on the fact that Hanan al uh, who is a really important Lebanese feminist writer, um, has edited a version of The Thousand and One Nights. In this version, she tries to give Shahrazad a little bit more agency at the end, which I won't spoil for you in case you want to read it. But I also want to bring this up to resist the understanding that the Knights themselves are a foundational text for everything that the Arabic literary scene has ever produced. It is an important example of the kind of folklore that some of these texts do build on though. Also, uh, just as a fun fact, Hanan al Sheikh is Wes Anderson's mother-in-law, which I didn't discover until quite recently. So that's another fun fact that you can all just have. Moving on to al Sheikh's actual work. The figure of the Karina is present in the story of Zahra. So the story of Zahra is a polyphonic novel set around the civil war in Lebanon. It follows her as she tries to negotiate the war and her own life within a patriarchal context. This includes how her mother would use Zahra to uh, lie to her father about going to see her lover and would say that something like Zahra has a uh, doctor's appointment or something like that to cover up the romantic rendezvous. So Zara has affairs of her own when she grows up and has a number of abortions and hymenoplasties. And eventually she goes to Africa, we never get more specific than that, uh, to visit her uncle who becomes lecherous. While there his advances and the disastrous marriage that she enters into leads to her going into a period of mental ill health and thus returning to Lebanon to have ECT or electroconvulsive therapy. As a slight caveat, there are lots of problems with the English translation that we have for Zara, but this is what we have, so we're stuck with it for now. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, the Karina first appears to Zara when she accompanies her mother to meet her lover for the first time, perhaps uh, signalling the first moment of psychological troubling and the guilt over having helped her cover up an affair. In many ways, the double of her Karina could also be a stand-in for how she feels about her own mother, that she herself is a, her own mother's double and all the guilt that comes with. The Karina eventually visits her again when she returns to Beirut as an adult. Zara narrates that the, the Karina crouched in one of the room's corners and watched me. This in itself is a horrifying image reminiscent of ghosts and dark corners throughout that we find quite comfortably throughout Gothic literature. The Karina al Sheikh writes, arrived in the company of a man whose figures, uh, who, features I couldn't make out. The weight of his body had contradicted any thought that I might be dreaming. The weight of his body had given me a faint shiver, as though he had held the peacock's feather and tickled me with its eye. The feather moved all over my body until it reached my lower regions. I felt myself shiver with pleasure under the gaze of my Karina as she watched me from her corner. Whenever I longed to complete a shiver to reach my climax, I felt embarrassed by her presence. I tried to rise, but the man's weight pressed down. I began to raise my hips following the feather's movements. I needed to submit to the, my ecstasy, even though I was still aware of my Karina lurking in the shadows. And all at once, there was no trace of my Karina or the man. We may read this as a, we may read this as a way for Zara to use her Karina as a proxy. It's as if the Karina is a proxy for child Zara, who is in turn reenacting uh, re her mother's own sexual transgressions. Zara would often be nearby when her mother was actually conducting the affair. In this way, Zara performs psychological mastery over her sense of separation or abandonment from her mother using her mirror image, the Karina. Altern alternatively, we can read this as a moment of masturbation, where Zara circumvents her own desires and, and is able to, in some sense, blame the mischievous Karina and the phantom man that she brings with her for what is happening, and thus the responsibility for her body and sexual desires is transferred onto the Karina. Uh, 
Even in her imaginative engagement with sex in this passage, it's displaced. The phantom man's touch is mediated through this feather, but the term as though he tickled me with a feather suggests that he had actually touched her in the fantasy. Zara emphasizes her passivity in the phantom sexual encounter with a voyeuristic Karina um, disappearing once she's climaxed. At the moment of sexual satisfaction, uh, the Karina as Zara's sexualized and seductive bi-proxy double no longer serves her purpose as an alternative self or supernatural power on which to blame her sexual impulses. And so she disappears. Zara's relationship with the Karina is a bit like that of the modern Gothic heroine and what Joanna Roth Russ calls the other woman. According to Russ's essay on the modern Gothic, the other woman is more worldly than the heroine, more beautiful and more openly sexual. The other woman is immoral. Immoral is italic. The Karina represents the part of herself that Zara must, uh, most closely identifies with her adulterous mother and that she is the, her immoral mother's own double. Yet in fragmenting this part of herself as a Karina, her supernatural twin, this part of herself becomes both alluring and fearsome. Likewise, the arrangement of Kar the Karina in the corner and the phantom man whose weight pressed down on Zara so that she cannot move is I think, reminiscent of Henry Fuseli's uh, The Nightmare. In The Nightmare, a young woman is stretched on her bed and is pinned down by a ghoul-like incubus while a nightmare looks on from a dark corner. Charles Stewart it points out that erotic dreams have raised perennial questions about the boundaries of the self and the individual's ability to control and produce this self. The nightmare has sex sexual and psychological undertones where there is at once a sense of dread and of submission to pleasure, pleasure almost like Zara narrates, this kind of push-pull of attraction revulsion is something that we often see in women's gothics. This paradoxical experience of the erotic nightmare has, according to Stuart, roots in the Christian teachings of Eva Gyrus, a monk in Egypt from around 382 CE. Demons could manipulate an individual's previously acquired emotionally charged memories and excite the passions. Evil thoughts were sim simultane ex simultaneously exogenous and endogenous. Demons activated what was already there. Thus, the erotic nightmare comes to characterize Zara's troubled relationship with her own sexuality under the restrictions of patriarchy. To move on slightly, much like European Gothic traditions, it is not just medieval or Jahia mythological creatures like the Karina, which represent contemporary fears, but also of a fear to, of a return to a more barbarous time is present in these texts. I want to gesture to Hanan al-Saman's excellent book, The Anxiety of Erasure, where she discusses and theorizes what Ad al-Banat, or the female infant burial, uh, pre-Islamic Bedouin practice of burying unwanted infant daughters alive. There's a motif in Arab women's writing with female characters recognizing themselves or others as al-Mauda, or the buried daughter. Al-Saman discusses the motif of the Wa'ad alongside the symbolic foremother of Shahrazad, who is able to defy oblivion and symbolic death through storytelling. Al-Saman argues that the motif of Wa'ad al-Banat allows the traumatic past to be retrieved in its full corporeal intensity by forcing the characters to revisit the site of forgotten historical traumas so as to engender a process of remembering and of overcoming unresolved cultural memories. I think this motif of unburying, or indeed the morbid image of being buried alive and all that comes with it, offers to contemporary feminist writers a gothic mode to explore cultural silences around the female body and around violence against women. Leila actually reminded me in the reading group this week um, of Fadia Fakir's essay on contemporary femicide in Jordan, where Fakir posits that the statistics that we have surrounding these deaths are actually incomplete and that to this day, women in Jordan might be listed as missing, when in fact they may have been killed in a so-called honor killing and then buried in the desert. What this means for the Arab feminist context is that the hauntings by ghosts and mythical figures, as well as the figurative uncovering of female remains, both act as evidence of female uh, suppressed female genealogies. And in these texts, recall and reimagine silence herstories of inter or transgenerational trauma, or indeed simply a sense of danger for which there is little other evidence 
as Fakir describes. As Sigmund Freud notes, to many people, the idea of being buried alive while appearing to be dead is the most uncanny thing of all. So this brings us to the word almanac trope in a couple of examples. Uh, we see this trope a little bit in uh, the fall of the Imam. Excuse me, one moment. So the fall of the Imam is a surreal text by the late Nawal El Sadawi. I think I'm a, probably the only uh, scholar of Nawal El Sadawi who actually likes the fall of the Imam, but there we go. Uh, published in 1988, the novel centres around Bint Allah, whose name means daughter of God, who attempts to find and assassinate her father, the Imam. The Imam had raped her mother, and Bint Allah and her mother are interchangeable throughout the surreal text, with many episodes repeating with slight variations, suggesting a sense of cyclicality to women's oppression in the Islamic fundamentalist state that al Sadawi narrates. Bint Allah herself is also fairly impervious to death and harm and has some supernatural qualities about her. The Fall, however, does not literally take place in Egypt, but rather takes place in a fictionalized Arab country. But it's generally acknowledged that, that the assassination of the Imam in the text is a reference to the assassination of President Anwar Sadat in 1981. On one occasion, uh, when Bint Allah or her mother have been imprisoned are, and are about to be raped by the Imam, she narrates that she is in the dark pit where I lay deep in the earth. When Bint Allah or her mother are subject to patriarchal control, there is no difference between a live state and a dead state. In either case, she is al Ma'uda, a woman buried alive. Yet towards the end of the text, after yet another unsuccessful stoning attempt by the Imam's guards, uh, which includes a partial live burial, the guards were trying to pull her head from her body. They discovered that her roots were plunged deep into the soil and they became afraid. In this instance, being al Ma'uda, uh, taken quite literally, uh, means that Bint Allah's rootedness defies the conventional narratives of erasure that live burial normally evokes. Thereupon, the Imam's guards decide that her files should be buried deep down in the earth forever. Their decision to bury her file an object that reminds the reader of the state apparatus that rigidly enforces this patriarchal order amid a quite surreal text, suggests that her body and her story are not only interchangeable, but are also subject to reincorporation into patriarchal society and control using a historical barbarous practice. That these methods are, at least symbolically, not that far behind us. To have a look at this in another text, uh, in Moral al tahawis 1998 novel, The Tent, looks at Wa'ad al-Banat in a more literal sense. Uh, the novel follows uh, Fatim, a young Bedouin girl. Uh, Bedouins are a desert roaming social group uh, around Egypt. Uh, Moral al tahawi herself is also Bedouin. In the novel, uh, Fatim has imaginary friends well into adulthood due to a fall which renders her disabled. The novel contains ghosts, visions, and even a witch who lives at the bottom of a well. But the novel, much like the fall of Zahra in many ways, uses these supernatural beings to follow Fatim's descent into mental ill health. For instance, Fatim is convinced that her imaginary friend Zawa uh, has a father called Musalam who would bury her in their native desert. The desert itself is described as feminine, that the soft swells and winding curves of the desert's body shift and change. Here we can see a conflation between the landscape and the female body. We might remember that when Hayek discussed how the Nada sensation story was concerned with anxieties over women's bodies, here the desert not only represents a fearsome sight for women where many uh, unrecorded femicides may have their evidence, but it also represents the fearsome capacities of femininity toward patriarchy, that the female body is ungovernable and could destabilize patriarchal order. This threat to patriarchy is realized when due to these shifts and changes, eventually Musalam disappeared, even though he knew the desert like the back of his hand. The former description of the curves of the sand foregrounds how, how Musalam is troubled by this, interchange, this changeability in his daughter's, uh, his own daughter's adolescent body, explicitly eventually evoking Wa'ad al-Banat. al tahawi writes that every day Zawa grew, fears crowded in on his heart. He said to Sagima, Zawa's mother, 
I dream about Zawa with the blood pouring from her beating heart and twisting in a thick trickle between her legs. This anxiety turns into an obsession with burying Zawa, conflating her body with the changeable desert and hanging around outside her tent at all hours of the night, as if almost building up the nerve to actually go ahead and kill her. It transpires that Zawa and her father are both characters from stories that Fatim had been told as a child. So here, Fatim is transferring her own fears of being buried alive onto her imaginary friend at the advent of her own suitability for marriage. In fact, her grandfather, uh, in, her grandfather advises her father uh, when Fatim's sisters are resisting a marriage that he's arranged for them to bury his daughters before they bury your reputation bind them in chains of iron and throw them into a kind man's house. Later, this uh, actually escalates to her imagined discovery of her own corpse in the well at the height of her own breakdown. She narrates how I dug in the dirt, I looked at the bottom of the rotten decaying well and saw worms crawling over my corpse. In this way, the literal burial of daughters, <coughs> please excuse me. Mm. So in this way, a literal burial represents to Fatim a figurative burial of live women in a marital home, but it is also uh, entrapment within the general patriarchal system, which has led to her mental ill health. This is a text where perhaps reflecting some of the Western Gothics that we're familiar with, such as the turn of the screw and Jane Eyre, where supernatural uh, happenings and madness are actually interchangeable. The limits between them are ambiguous. The buried daughter trope in the tent reflects not only the very real possibility of femicide in the context of the novel, but also broader feelings of entrapment. So as we can see, spaces such as the desert would be important to an Arab feminist Gothic. However, this is not the only Gothic space. I wouldn't be able to do this session without taking you to at least one haunted house. So I'm suggesting that we find this today in Mariam's Maze, which is a short, surreal novel that fo follows Mariam al Pagi and her family following the death of her father, Yusuf. The fo novel follows Mariam as she struggles to remember uh, that she too has died, um, in some way perhaps a version of al Maouda or an Afrit, perhaps. The novel represents her living death ambiguously, occasionally portraying Mariam's ghostly double, her Karina, who at the beginning of the novel has also stabbed her. There's lots of folklore about if a Karina stabs you or kills you in your dream, you die in real life. Nevertheless, the al Tagi family is questionably aristocratic due to the Egyptian land reforms in the 1950s. And the al Tagi palace is positioned as an ancestral home is haunted. The diminishing wealth and status of the al Tagi family is cause for anxiety as Mariam is Yusuf's only child, leaving no male heirs. Botting points out that the old house represents both building and family line. Anxieties, he says, varied according to diverse changes, which could include political revolution, industrialization, urbanization, shifts in sexual and domestic organization. And this was very much the case in the uh, political and social landscape in Egypt, which informed this narrative. So the El Tagli Palace is no exception. I always find it interesting also to look at the covers of texts that I engage with. Um, I think these tell us crucial information about how these texts operate on a world literary market, and they tell us how publishers think these texts are best represented in images. I would also, also say that perhaps the Gothic is quite a visually charged genre. So you'll notice that both of these covers uh, reference decaying or neglected architecture that has an aristocratic edge to it especially in the second image, which is Matahat Mariam, literally Mariam's maze in Arabic. My sense is that these images convey a complex sense of uh, e abandoned Egypt through a number of historical and political struggles. Mariam's family is an aristocratic family who lost much wealth during the 1952 Egyptian land reforms where they had to pass off parts of their land and give them to other people. And so there may be a sense of decay of class structure and therefore the structure of society overall here. So it's easy to read the El Tagli Palace as a Gothic house. Ez Aldine starts each section of the text with a short framing tableau, such as the one that I have up here, which opens the entire text. 
Throughout the novella, short folkloric and supernatural stories about the El Pagi Palace, Mar Mariam's ancestral home, uh, begins each section as if the house itself haunts the rest of the narrative, no matter where Mariam goes. So S. L. Dean writes of a magnificent palace with domes and marble facades designed to be unlike any other building, filled with as many cellars and corridors as El Targi could, as well as spacious halls and windows with coloured glass and wide balconies. Despite these, <coughs> I apologise. Mm. So, despite being spacious and wide, the palace literally chokes its inhabitants where Jasmine envelops the palace in a disturbing smell, making them gasp for breath. The house itself is confusing with an expansive layout, which is disorientating for everyone who steps inside, which I think almost opens up the space for the hauntings in the novel. In the logic of the novel, ghosts exist and trouble Marion by walking with heavy steps and banging on doors. Sometimes Marion herself is a ghost haunting the space, um, which not only leaves an effect on the mind, but the atmosphere and choking air also has an embodied effect, once again leading to a sense of psychical and psych physical and psychological entrapment within the patriarchal family structures. Excuse me one moment. <coughs> mm. So this sense of confinement recalls the tradition of houses that imprison women in Western feminist Gothic writing. Uh, read by Wallace and Smith as an ambivalence over female identity in the context of women's role in securing capital in the traditional Gothic novel. These kinds of vignettes that house the descriptions of the, uh, of the palace itself disrupt the progression of the narrative. As soon as we might start to orientate ourselves in this surreal novel, we're shuttled back to the palace. Mariam's maze remakes the Gothic traditional symbolism of the ancestral house as a site of inescapable familial and domestic conventions such as marriage and childbirth, not by confining the narrative to the house itself or even really Mariam to these, this kind of fate, but instead by having Mariam and us as readers through these vignettes always return to the house. The site is not inescapable because Mariam is physically trapped there because she ultimately doesn't have anywhere else to go. Excuse me. As a final note, I've only discussed four texts which engage with Jahiliya folklore and the Gothic backdrop of the Wa'ad al banat uh, or female infant burial. However, there are lots of Arab feminist texts which engage with these questions of confinement, psychological and real hauntings, of gender roles, of inherited and in intergenerational trauma, out there that I, that I would really encourage you to read and engage with. The Gothic, I think, offers a frame to understand these feminist concerns, but more importantly, to appreciate the dark, psychologically driven feminist aesthetics of novelists like Hanan al-Sheikh, uh, Nawal al-Sadawi, Miral al-Tahawi, and Masura Ezeldin. To end, I'd like to share with you a couple of examples. Oh. <coughs> I'm really sorry, everyone. I'd like to share with you an example of how these feminist aesthetics spill off of the page into feminist activism. In 2016-17, campaign group Abad Mina campaigned against the Lebanese Penal Code, Article 522, which states that if a man rapes a woman, he can avoid criminal prosecution by marrying her. They launched a big campaign called A White Dress Does Not Cover the Rape, which included the art installation piece that I have up here. So this piece is called Undress 522 by Mirelle Honin, which was installed on the Beirut Corniche. The Corniche is a large public walkway which overlooks the sea and is used for lots of different kind of leisure activities. The piece itself comprises of several hanging wedding dresses to represent women who died or suffered as a result of Article 522. As a disclaimer, Abad used to have statistics online about how many women per year die as a result, direct result of this law. Um, and I read a long time ago that this installation has a number of wedding dresses that fit that number. But I haven't actually been able to track down those statistics in some time, and so I'm quite un uncertain about them. Again, this recalls Fakir's assertion about the femicide in Jordan. We just don't have 
reliable statistics about some things, these histories are really suppressed. However, the shapes show a depersonification of each dead woman who is symbolized here by a, literally replacing her with a loaded cultural object, the wedding dress. They are symbolically ghostly, perhaps evoking Bluebeak's wives, or as I'm hoping to publish on, um, or indeed the ghosts in Mariam's maze. As part of the same campaign, activists themselves donned go ghostly wedding dresses and blooded various parts of their bodies to protest in front of MPs. This campaign uses Gothic imagery to evoke that which has been suppressed and silenced. The silencing of some women's experiences of violence at the hands of their husbands was taken out of the private realm and into the public sphere in this and the art installation. The unspeakable nature of the violence and the experiences that some women faced due to Article 522 is reflected in the activists' attempt to carve out a new way of thinking about this code by using Gothic symbolism. Both the installation art and the protest see women creatively intervene to find ways to represent and recover forgotten and silenced women. You'll be pleased to hear that Article 522 was successfully overturned in 2017, and the Abad campaign first raised awareness of the penal code existing at all. According to their website, when the campaign launched, only 1% of the Lebanese population even knew that this article existed. So this campaign was about the exposure and knowledge dissemination. There's much to suggest that Arab feminist gothics draw on local histories and folklore to uncover women's real experiences in an intellectual and creative way. Although today I also hope that I've uncovered for you the way that women's writing in Al Mashrek has been part of a cultural pouring back and forth of what we call the Gothic. Thank you so much for your attention. I would warmly welcome any questions or thoughts that you might have. Thank you so much. <laughs>